Hey guys, welcome to another video. Today we're going to be covering the topic of atomic structure um, in the IGCSE chemistry syllabus. And this is really important because it really builds the foundation of chemistry. So if you don't understand this, then you won't really understand anything else in the whole course. So this is really important. So without further ado, let's begin. So an atom is defined as the smallest particle of a chemical element. And a chemical element is basically a substance that is composed of just a single type of atom. For the sake of simplicity, let's take a look at the fact that you build a big yellow Lego wall simply just using these yellow Lego block units. Because this whole wall was built with just this uh, yellow unit, this represents an element and this represents a single atom. If you had, of course, you've got different types of atoms. You could have green blocks, you could have blue blocks. And if you make a blue wall from just blue blocks, then that would be a different element from this one. Okay, so that's fairly simple. So the element carbon, for example, is only made of carbon atoms and the element oxygen would only be made of oxygen atoms and so forth. You do get the gist. So the structure of an atom is actually made of three subatomic particles. You've got the neutrons, the protons, and the electrons. Really important distinctions between these is first of all, the charge. The charge of a proton is a positive one. The charge of an electron is a negative one. Neutrons do not have any charge at all. Secondly, the weight is also quite important. The weight of a protein is you know, given that it's relative to each other, just one unit. Neutrons also weigh one unit and electrons weigh nothing at all. Okay, so this table here to the right summarizes this. Just be aware that this is the exact relative mass, 1 in 1840, but for the sake of your course, this is basically negligible. So you can say that electrons have zero weight. Now, so the protons and the neutrons are located in the nucleus, which is the central part of the atom here. And the electrons are always in orbit of the nucleus, and they, ha they sort of lie in what we call shells, which are represented as ring-like structures that we draw around the nucleus. So let's take a look at that in a bit more detail. But before that, there's a couple of things that we need to go through. The number of protons is defined by the proton number or the atomic number, right? And the, in, in, in an atom, the number of protons will always equal the number of electrons. And that's really important. And that, that's the reason why atoms never have any charge because the number of the, the charge from the protons will always balance out the charge from the electrons, making it a resultant charge of zero always. If you have an imbalance in the number of protons and electrons, then it will have a charge. But at that point, we don't call it an atom anymore. We call it an ion. So, that's quite important and we'll look at that in a bit more detail when we look at ionic bonding and things like that, right? The other thing is that the number of protons and the number of neutrons, when you add that together, we call that the mass number because again, the mass is really only defined by protons and neutrons because as we said before, electrons have zero mass. Okay, so this is quite important because this is what the periodic table will tell us. So. Let's take a look at the electron arrangement just for a second. I've said that electrons are held inside these shells and we, we sort of draw that as rings around the nucleus. So you've got the nucleus right in the middle here and you've got the shells that are surrounding it. It's important to understand that the very first inner shell, which is closest to the nucleus, has a maximum capacity of two electrons. So you can't have any more than two electrons in the first shell. In the next two shells, however, you can have a maximum of up to eight in each of these. So that becomes um, a bit more apparently important and useful for us when we take a look at uh, you know the the drawing out the diagram of different atoms later on. So this is a periodic table. The periodic table basically lists out all the elements that we know of. Okay, and for example, we've got hydrogen here, helium here, you know, all sorts of things. Um, and the information that the periodic table gives us is quite important. So let's take a look at the element oxygen, for example. Let's zoom that up. So what you have is obviously the name of the element, and you've got the chemical symbol for the element, and you've got these two numbers here. So the top number, or the, the smaller number, 
is what we call the proton number. And we talked about this before. It's simply the amount of protons in a single oxygen atom. And this is the mass number. And remember, mass number is a sum of protons and neutrons. So just from this example, or this information that we have here, we can actually determine the number of protons, neutrons, and electrons in a single oxygen atom. So obviously, the proton number is 8, because it says so. Uh, the neutron number is 8, because the proton number plus neutron number is 16 in this case, so there must be 8 neutrons. The electron number, as we discussed before, is always equal to the proton number in an atom, so in this case it's also 8. So when we put that into a diagram, you've got the 8 protons and the 8 neutrons inside the nucleus, and in the first shell, because it can only have 2 electrons, you put the two electrons there, and the rest is in the most outer electrons. The really important thing is initially just to draw the rings and fill in the electrons from the most inner shell. So ignore the rest, and first, pull, initially um, you just fill in the electrons from the most inner shell and then go outwards. So if this was blank, you would put two in, and then because you have six electrons remaining, you would fill that in the most outer shell. So you can see here that an oxygen atom has two electrons in its inner shell and its most outer shell, it's got six electrons. So two short of its maximum. So this brings us to the topic of chemical reactivity. Atoms have one single goal, and that is to achieve a full outer shell of electrons. So chemical reactions basically occur because atoms want to achieve this goal. So let's take a look at our oxygen atom. And we discussed before that an oxygen atom has six electrons in its outer shell. This means that it is too short of having a full outer shell. Remember, because this second shell can hold up to 8 electrons. This means that oxygen can achieve its goal in wanting a full outer shell in two simple ways. It's either you add two electrons into this outer shell, or you can remove six electrons so that this whole shell gets removed and it basically disappears, only leaving you with this inner shell, which of course has a full shell because it's got two electrons in there already. Of course, if you really think about it logically, which is easier, putting two or removing six? Of course, adding two is so much easier and in reality, removing six electrons never happens. It's always adding two electrons and it does that either by sharing electrons with other, other atoms, which is what we'll talk about in future videos like covalent bonding and things like that, or it simply just gets it by the by process of uh, transfer, and that's called ionic bonding. But again, we'll cover that in a, in, in a topic uh, in future videos. Okay, so that brings us to the next topic of what about these things here, right? So to the right of the periodic table, we call these noble gases. For example, helium already has a full outer shell. It's got two electrons in its most outer shell, which is also its inner shell, by the way, but it's only got one shell. And so basically, it already has what it wants. So all of these elements to the right, these are called noble gases, and all of these, every single one of them, has a full outer shell to begin with. That's why these gases are inert. In other words, they're unreactive, simply because they don't need to react with anything. They've already achieved their goal, and they're pretty happy with how they are. They're very stable um, elements. So therefore, they're unreactive. So that just strengthens the idea that atoms really want to achieve a full outer shell, and that's why reactions happen in the first place. So that's it for today, guys. Please check, uh, please check out uh, my website, www.freeexamacademy.com, for extra notes. I am in the process of making some notes, particularly for this topic, so check it out. Otherwise, please like, share, and subscribe for more revision videos, and comment if you want any specific topics to be covered. So thank you, guys, and I will see you in the next video.